Um, we can say machine learning is, well, some people say it's code that thinks. But um, in that case, we'll have to define what is thinking. Yes, this is a machine learning ABC session. Um, not really. This session is, I know that uh, some of you know machine learning, and I know that some of you don't know anything about it. So this is a session that is aimed at uniting both groups. It's aimed at both kinds of people. So this is more of a introspection session that we can think about what machine learning actually is like. So uh, if we say machine learning is a machine that thinks, it would we would have to define the meaning, the definition of thinking. And so let's talk about something a little more basic. Let's talk about algorithms. So I'm sure many of you have heard of algorithms and what an algorithm is. An algorithm is a set of instructions that you follow one after the other. And you know that computers work using algorithms. Everything a computer does is an algorithm. What about humans? Do we work as algorithms? Yes or no answer, like in the chat. Do you think humans work as algorithms? Shoham says, yes, a very complex algo. That's actually the perfect answer. Um, yeah, humans work as algorithms, but um, it's very difficult to actually say, uh, to actually write that algorithm. Yes, uh, we can't understand how our own brain works perfectly. If we could, then we probably could have written a code for it. But um, that is a very good point, Shion. Uh, many algorithms simultaneously is actually one of the points I was going to discuss. Because the way a human thinks and the way a machine thinks is not the same. And so far, it has not been possible to completely replicate a human brain. Because even though the human brain also runs algorithms, and complex algorithms are still algorithms, but even then, uh, it's not the same because the way we store data is simply different from the way a computer stores data. A computer handles data in binary. So that's a zero or a one, a yes or a no, true or a false. Humans don't work that way. Now, a very common machine learning model is uh, uh, OCR, optical character recognition, which is if I write a number in my own handwriting, digit classification. If I write a number, the computer is going to see the number and say, OK, this is a three or this is a four. Uh, let me just use a jam board. Yeah. So what happens if I write this? It's a three, right? It, it, it looks like a three. Everyone can tell me it's a three. Um, how can you tell me it's a three? Because at some point in our childhood, we learned that a pattern like this is it means three. And what is a three? It is this quantity, three different things. That is a three. Now, suppose it was a little ambiguous. Some, suppose it's like this. Okay. Maybe make it a little more ambiguous. Okay. Now I'm like, this is a three, but it also could be an eight because it's a really bad handwriting. So, but I will never say this is a four. Um, but when we are working with classical algorithms, uh, like the kind of algorithms we write in our C laboratory code, uh, we don't really have the provision to say this could be a three or this could be an eight, but it's definitely not a four. That's just not the way the computer processes. Or maybe you could find a way to do it, but it would be complicated. And it cannot be scaled 
very high. So the human brain processes a lot of information at the same time. And with a lot of surrounding data, and this data is called context. So a machine learning model, another difference between a machine learning model and the human brain is you have often seen machine learning models for object detection. You have seen it for, <laughs> Obirup has just written a very, he's just trolling in the comments right now. So you've seen machine learning models for object detection, for OCR, uh, digit classification, but you will never see a single model doing everything. You won't have a machine learning model that can produce speech, that can hear um, and process speech and see, detect objects, and also um, make predictions based on unknown data or any kinds of data. That's just not something one model can do, but it is something that the human brain can do. And we just process so much of information because we have context. We go on the basis of context, and this context is gathered from our daily experiences. Now, a trained machine learning model has a very specific context. So a model that has been trained to uh, you know, tell the difference between a cat and a dog if you give it the picture of a tree, it's probably going to call it a cat or a dog with very less confidence. But a human won't do that. The human's going to be like, okay, this is a tree. Now, uh, maybe you could expand your machine learning model to make it detect all kinds of objects, but then it won't be able to hear speech. It won't be able to hear what I'm saying and translate it into text. So we have those limitations when we're working with machine learning models because one model simply does not do everything, whereas the human brain does. So we're not perfect when it comes to replicating the human brain. And that is exactly what we try to do when we're doing machine learning. Machine learning is nothing but mapping the human brain into algorithms. And because the human brain is so complicated, it's so complex, we cannot map it into one algorithm. So we map it into several algorithms and we use one at a time whenever we need it. So let's get to some slides. I know it's a little small, but hopefully, okay. I will be calling out everything. It's very small. Sorry about that, but this is the problem with Bevy. Um, maybe if I, can I zoom in? No, I can't. All right, so let's just talk about some basic terminology that I'll be using. So I want to talk about it. Okay, so Arnab says it's fine. Obhirup, if you can make that model, then I think you should write a paper on it. Um, some basic terminology to start with. Uh, first is the model. And your model is nothing but uh, your trained code. Your model is suited for a particular situation. It has a problem statement. It has an input. It has an output. That is your model. Agent is anything that makes a decision. So it's not necessary that every ML model has an agent, but an agent is typical in, say, reinforcement learning, which is a subclassification of machine learning, where you have something that does make a decision, and that is called an agent. Training is the process of teaching your model. Now, teaching is an interesting um, term, so let's elaborate on that a little bit later. Data is examples for your model to learn from, and data point is one such example. Now, I came a little uh, ahead. I talked about training and data and teaching. So what does that mean? I started this by saying that machine learning can be said it's a code that thinks, and then I went into explaining what exactly thinking is. 
but i don't personally i don't like calling machine learning code that thinks because i call it code that predicts and that's because it's not really thinking the code um when we're working with machine learning models it's making a prediction and for any prediction it requires data an informed prediction now how accurate this prediction is depends on the data now suppose uh suppose obhirup is a straight a student he gets a 10 gpa in every subject now on the basis of his last six semesters i can make a prediction that okay next semester he's going to get a 10 GPA in software engineering. And this is an informed prediction. This is a prediction made on data. It's not a random guess. A random guess is if I just uh, pick a random person and say, okay, this person's gonna get a eight and I don't even know this person at all. And so for any prediction, you need data. Similarly, a machine learning model, if it's a code that makes predictions, then it needs data. It needs the data to make that prediction. And that data is in the form of input and output. Now, imagine a machine learning model to be a child, a little kid. And this kid doesn't know much. The child has not learned anything yet. And you're teaching this child how to count and you show four fingers and you say this is a four and maybe you have to teach it a few times maybe 10 or 20 times and after the 10th time the child should be able to say yeah this is a four the child knows it now so that's how the child is learning and that's how humans learn we learn from our experiences we're not born into this world with knowledge we have experiences, we see the outcome, we see if there's a kind of reward or punishment associated with it, and that accelerates our learning. Similarly, in machine learning, if you have a reward system, something that gives you a positive outcome, then you know that, okay, I am supposed to be repeating this behavior. This was a good choice. This was a good prediction. Whereas if I punish a certain behavior, then I know that this was not a good idea. I should not do this again in the future. And maybe I'll make some mistakes. Maybe I'll repeat it once or twice. But after that, you know, I learn that I should not do this or I should do something else. Now, Shankho Mitra has a question. How does one reward or punish a computer? Let's uh, think about our rewards and punishments in terms of algorithms. Uh, what is a reward? Suppose I did well on a test and my mom got me a chocolate. That could be a reward, right? Um, what is a punishment? Suppose I touch a really hot vessel and I realize, okay, this is really hot. It burnt my fingers. That's a punishment, that feeling of pain. Now, a computer won't feel pain. A computer doesn't want chocolate. But the computer doesn't even know what it wants because we have to tell the computer, this is what you want. Now, if you quantify that reward, if you say uh, punishment is a minus one and a reward is a plus one, and we want the final value to be as much as possible. Suppose it's like a quiz. And if you get the right answer, you get points. And if you get the wrong answer, you get negative points. That's actually a very good example of a reward system. So you are motivated to give correct answers in the quiz. Whereas if you give the wrong answer, you probably won't win anything. And you can use this same comparison in a computer as well. Now suppose, okay, let's go back to the Jamboard. And okay, now suppose I have a box, okay? It's a box, believe that, a really crooked one. Now, I have some things in this. Um, I give you some context, okay? I'll tell you this has 
19 red apples and it has one green apple okay i give you this box and i tell you okay this is a quiz um or maybe okay we're playing a game and the person who loses has to do the dishes doing the dishes is that a reward or a punishment that's um a punishment right you don't really want to do dishes so you will be motivated to give the right answer now i say okay in this box which has 20 apples 19 are red one is green and i'm going to pick out any one apple from there and you know i'm i don't know i i'm not seeing what i'm picking out but i pick out an apple and i want you to guess what color i'm going to pick out what what are you going to guess like just type in the chat once which guess would you make red or green yeah everyone says red yeah there's a 95 percent chance that this apple is going to be red oh my god <laughs> i am using a mouse yeah <laughs> that was a struggle there's a 95 percent chance that it's going to be a red apple and because you want to be correct you will make the guess that this is going to be a red apple now suppose you don't know how many apples there are in this uh, suppose this information has not been given to you, you know, 19 red, one green. You just know that there are red and green apples. And suppose you can make an infinite number of guesses. Like you can have, there are a, an infinite number of tries in this game. You can play this game an infinite number of times. So what should your strategy be when you're making the guess? How would you make this guess? I'm playing the game and I don't know. I just know there's red and green apples in there. I don't know how many there are. Abhirup knows too much uh, machine learning, so he's using technical terms. He said, generate data. Let's not go into fancy terms. Maximum data for a given sample space. Let's go with something, a uh, simple strategy. You don't know how many red and green apples there are, which means you basically have no data. So when you have no data, what is a prediction with zero data? A prediction with zero data is nothing but a guess. Yeah, and I've got it right. So you just guess. I'll make a guess. I, I'll say green, OK? Yeah, it's not a prediction. It's a prediction with zero data. It's a guess. A guess can also be a prediction. So I'll, I'll predict that, okay, this is a green apple. And, you know, the first time I make this guess, it turns out to be a red apple. Okay, second time also, it's a red. And third time, it's also a red. In fact, let's uh, red times... 14 and then maybe you get a green apple and then once again you get red times maybe 17. so after some time i realized that okay my strategy is not working uh green is not really a very good strategy because clearly it has more red because the statistics show that I am, there's a higher probability that I'm going to have a red apple. So after some point, after getting it wrong a certain amount of time, I'm going to say, okay, instead of uh, always guessing green, I'm going to change my strategy to guess whichever color was picked at the last chance. So I got a red, so I keep picking red until I hit the green. And then I say, OK, this time I'll choose green. And then I keep hitting red again. So now I have, I've made two errors this time. Now, 
if i am a sophisticated model if i am a little smarter i'll say okay instead of making that guess i'm going to take a sample of uh, certain uh, chances i'm going to keep analyzing the chances that i've taken in this game and i'm going to say you know whichever has occurred more number of times i'm going to guess that and since i have 14 reds and once i get a green even then i predict red i get this one wrong basically and then after 15 chances i see i have 14 reds and one green so then i'll say okay since 14 is more than one i'm going to guess red so the next time this red i'll get it correct so we've reduced our errors from 2 to 1 by simply changing up the strategy a little bit making it more probabilistic and this is an uh, an example of machine learning i think a lot of you have some exposure of machine learning you know what we do when we're training a model so shankar mitra says it's collecting data at this point yes that is true we are collecting data to like anubhav said turn our guess into a prediction because if you have enough data you can make a prediction it's no longer a guess so what happens in a machine learning model you need data you need to make predictions so the difference between a human and a computer is humans don't need that much data we we have some other thinking processes we have a lot of algorithms going on simultaneously which means we can make many weighted decisions without seeing a lot of data a computer does not have context and that's why it needs a lot of data to build that context and that's why we accept this data and this data is in the form of input and output if i give this input to this model what output do i want the model to give me so it's basically training it's like teaching a child it's like um, learning something new i have this question in an exam how should i answer it to get the mark to get the points it it's a lot like that and that's what's happening in a machine learning model you accept a very large amount of data well of course it depends on what you're doing but uh usually machine learning models accept a lot of data you analyze a pattern in that data and you make a prediction so i didn't talk about patterns yet so let's go for that now suppose let's take this problem statement um i'll give you a way i'll give you a height and you i want you to guess the weight of the person you know how tall this person is but you don't know their weight so let's take a uh, height on the x axis and weight on the y axis and let's make some plots in the graph graphs are very useful for visualizing data and this session is visualizing machine learning so we're going to use a lot of graphs now suppose someone is this tall and they weigh this many kgs so we have a data point here okay now we can have one strategy a very stupid strategy which says that okay based on the one data point that we have let's say that every person let's say this is x weight no not x actually w small w let's say every person in the world weighs w irrespective of their height irrespective of their weight their nationality their diet they just weigh w and if that's your approach then if you plot that function onto the graph you get a straight line like this and this is not a bad prediction in the sense that 
you have one data point and it's satisfying that data point. So it's not really, you know, I can't say it's wrong yet. I will say it's wrong after some time, but not right now. So let's take some more data. Let's say someone has, uh, someone's a little taller and they weigh a little more. So they're over here on the graph. Someone is a lot taller and they weigh over here, say. And let's take someone who's in the middle, who probably maybe is a little underweight over here. Someone over here who's a little overweight. So let's go, it's here. So now we have a, a not very linear image. What do you see a pattern here? It's hard to see one, right? But if I ignore these two, suppose they haven't come yet. Okay, these data points are not there yet. I just have these three then I can say this is a function y, where y is the weight w, is equal to mx plus c. You know, that's the equation of a straight line. And I'll say, OK, so just imagine that's a straight line. So this is a straight line that goes through all these three points. And if I say, OK, there's what about the point over here the person who's a little overweight what about the point here the person who's a little underweight now i can say um with enough data if we ignore the overweight and underweight people suppose there are more data points here here and here now we can say okay since majority of the people are satisfied with this function let's ignore the people who are not satisfied by the function. I know it doesn't sound very nice, but uh, these are, it's basically a prediction. I'm not saying that this is going to be correct at all times. It is not a declaration, it's not an answer, but it is a prediction. So if it works for majority, and the majority has to be something like maybe 90%, then we can say that, okay, we are satisfied with this function. We are satisfied with this model. Let's go with that. And whatever points that are here, this one, this one, these are considered to be outliers or exceptions. They do not, they're not entirely satisfied by our model, but bad luck, basically. And, okay. So let's take another similar, okay, this one. I, yeah, basically I was saying if we have, uh, if you're going for rewards in the bag example that I gave you, the a box with the apples and red and green apples, we want to maximize our reward. So we'll go for low risk. We'll not really, uh, we'll not say that we'll take green because you know what if there's green that's a high risk answer we'll go for red there's a 95 percent chance it's going to be red so that's a low risk answer that's what a model tends to do it takes less risks and that's why uh we ignore outliers there's less risk when we uh go with the function that satisfies majority because the probability of it satisfying is higher but when we go for, when we have to consider outliers, then there's high risk. Now let's take um, another similar example. This time I'm not using height and weight. This time I'm just saying X and FX. And it's very similar to the uh, example that I had just shown you. Suppose you have X equal to one. This is the only data you have. X is equal to one and your FX is equal to one. So what can FX be? You're just making a guess at this point. You're just guessing what the function is going to be. So we can make this guess. FX is equal to X. We could also say FX is equal to one. We could say FX is equal to X to the power five plus X to the power four plus X to the power three minus two X squared. That is also a valid function that works with this data point. It's, it's not wrong. 
But uh, just to keep things simple, let's say fx is equal to x, it satisfies. Now, the next data point, we have x is equal to 2, fx is equal to 3. So we need to change it a little bit. The function fx equal to x doesn't really work. So now let's say fx is equal to 2x minus 1. So now we have a linear function, a function of a straight line, a y equal to mx plus c. It's, it's simple yet. It's not very complicated. Um, next, if we say x equal to 3, fx equal to 7. Okay, it's a little, uh, it's not really working with the linear function. So let's go for some other function. Uh, we're going with x squared minus x plus 1. And, well, this satisfies, this happens to satisfy 0.4 and 5 as well. I also got tired of coming up with functions. It, this was uh, difficult to make this slide. So let's say, okay, this is the optimal function and it satisfies every data point. So if x is equal to 10, now the training phase of the machine learning model is over. We have converged on a function. We know, okay, this is the function we want. And now it's time to make predictions. Predictions are made on unknown data. And unknown data is data that has not been included in the training. So suppose I say x is equal to 10. We don't know what happens when x is equal to 10 because it wasn't in the examples. When we gave the model examples to train on, we only gave x equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but not 10. But because we converged on a particular function by analyzing the pattern of the data, we can make a prediction by following the same pattern. We use this function and we say, OK, fx is equal to 91. And the terms in machine learning for this is, well, first you have training data, which is the data used to train the function, uh, train the model to find the function. Then you have validation data to see if the function that you found, how good is it? Does it work for other data? It's basically trying to simulate a prediction. It's not unknown data yet, but I'm not training on this data but I still know what I want, what the output should be. And then finally, you have the testing data, which is completely unknown data. You do not know what the output is going to be. So um, training data, you know the input, you know the output. The machine knows the input, the machine knows the output. Validation, you know the output, but the machine does not know the output. And testing, neither you nor the machine knows what the output is going to be. Uh, we're not ending this yet, so premature slide. Okay, let's take this example. I said we're ignoring the outliers, right? What happens if we don't ignore the outliers? Um, suppose I want a function that's going to, you know, make the perfect prediction for every data point. Then I come up with a function that goes like, this it goes from here and then goes down here and goes like this, okay? Let's erase these parts. Cool. So this is our function. Um, the last function we had was a linear function, y equal to mx plus c. This is clearly not a linear function. Uh, this is it's pretty complicated, so it could be something as x to the power of 5 or x to the power of 6, something like that. This is no longer a straight line. This is a curve. And do we want a function like this? I mean, it makes perfect predictions, right? That should be a good thing. Isn't, isn't that desirable? Do we want this function? Why don't we go with this function? Like, do you want to... Right in the chat. Oh, Anjishno. <laughs> we have, why do we have machine learning experts in this session? Okay. <laughs> yeah, overfitting is bad for health. 
how will people work with such a weird function? Yeah, people are not working with this function. The computer is working with this function. So we can just say, OK, give me the highest accuracy. I don't care how complicated the function is. Uh, the computer is really fast. The computer doesn't make mistakes. Um, the computer can compute a lot of data at the same time without getting confused. So let's let the computer handle it. It's a weird function. It's complicated, but the computer can do it. But that's not why we're avoiding this function. Um, Anjishnu pretty much gave the answer. But uh, first years, anyone, uh, would you like to say if you want this function or not? Complexity. Um, not really. We're not bothered with complexity because a lot of machine learning models are very complex. Uh, similar answer, too much to calculate for computers? Not true. Difficult to come up with this function or no? Also not true. It's difficult for us. It's, it's not very difficult for a computer. So the answer is this situation is called overfitting. And I am not going to try to draw this. I'm just going to make use of this feature. I do not know how to type. Yeah. So this is called overfitting. And it's not a problem of complexity. It's not a problem of too much data or difficult for the computer to do this. Uh, actually, we avoid this situation because it's not a true representation of what's happening. Now, I told you this example is of weight versus height. Uh, of course, height is not the only feature that would determine your weight. It could be your nationality. It could be your diet. It could be your build. It could be um, your genetic history. Is your are your parents um, were your parents underweight? Were they overweight? Maybe it has come down genetically. It could be a bunch of factors. Age as well. Um, so suppose you have all these features now of course that would be very difficult to draw impossible to draw the graph for that but that's why we have linear algebra but let's make it simple and say okay it's just height and we're predicting the weight on the basis of the height and suppose this is the function that i've come up with and it it gives me perfect results for the training data and zero error, 100% accuracy. It's, a, it's the wonder model. It's perfect. Um, but the thing is, training data and in training data, both of us know the output. When it comes to validation data, it is not necessary that the output will lie on this function because the machine did not train on that output. So it is possible that you know you could have a data point here, you could have a data point here, you could have a data point here. Now what happens with these data points? We get errors. We we will predict something for someone who's this tall somewhere over here. We're going to predict some weight over here right? Someone who's this tall, we'll get a prediction of uh, somewhere over here. And like I said, machine learning is all about data. It's all about statistics. It's all about probability. What's the probability that these data points are going to be not on the function? So it's a trade-off between um the general pattern versus you know accounting for uh the data that's been given versus what the data would be 
And, and it is difficult to predict that. It is difficult to say that, okay, my training data is like my testing uh, data. It's difficult to say that whatever I have trained on is going to be what I, uh, I will be testing on. And that's what makes overfitting a huge problem. So suppose I have, say, a graph that looks like this. Uh, I have uh, data here, 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 here. The lines are getting bigger. Sorry about that. And then I have some data over here, here, here. OK. So an overfitted model here would be something like this. Sorry, this goes there, this goes there. A very chaotic model. Yeah. So this is what an overfitted model would look like. But the thing is, can I undo? Yes. The thing is, we are looking at a pattern that clearly goes like this. I mean, just if you visualize it, just if you see the graph, it's just a straight line that goes linearly. It keeps increasing with the x-axis. And maybe there are some outliers. There's a data point here, here. You'll get some error over here. They're a little far away from this line. This is the distance that they're far from the line. And yeah, that is some error. But you are much less likely to have more errors in the training data, sorry, in the testing data, versus with the overfitted function. Because um, you know that with increase in height, you will expect an increase in the weight. But you don't expect this. Um, there are exceptions, there are outliers, but the pattern of the data, the general trend of the data is not a sign function. And machine learning is basically trying to, you know, map the human brain. It's trying to do the same thing that humans do, think the same way that we do. And if, and this thinking is done on the basis of data, on the basis of logic. And if we know, logically speaking, that in, you know, it should be a simple graph or at least somewhat simple graph, then uh, there is no logical explanation for the deviations in that graph. So that's how I think about it. I know this is not the actual definition of overfitting, but I think about it uh, like this. You have a pattern, you have a trend, you follow that trend. You don't have to fit exactly to every data point because that's not going to give you the trend. That's going to give you a hyper accurate model that is not really giving you the true story. It's not telling you what the data actually represents. And machine learning, you can say it's kind of like a representation of data. And in this entire thing, I've spoken a lot about machine learning models, how they train, how they learn. Um, there is one huge assumption that's made here. Uh, can anyone tell me what this assumption is? It's, it's got to do with data. It's got to do with real life applications of machine learning. Uh, Shango Mitra says, we're not considering all variables. That's a, oh, all of you are coming up with some very good points. Uh, we're not considering all variables. Let's go with that one first, okay? Like I said, uh, height and weight, it's not really a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, there are many other factors, many other features. And, you know, the reason why I just chose one feature, which is height, is because I wanted to plot it. I wanted to make a 2D graph. Now, if I use two features, then it'll be a 3D graph. It'll have a z-axis like this. Now, if I use more features, it's not really going to be a graph at all because we don't have a way of visualizing four dimensions or five dimensions. So uh, when we're actually doing machine learning, when we're actually working with the model and not just uh, showing it in a lecture, then um, we're actually going to be using a lot of features. 
and in that will be in something called a feature vector and then we process those features we process the data using linear algebra and linear algebra is something that you will be learning in first year and second year and you should learn that properly if you're planning on doing machine learning so that's not a very big problem that we're not considering all variables yes it is an assumption that i made during this lecture but it's not a, an assumption that we make when we're actually working with models. Uh, Arnab gave a very good point, an assumption that we have data. Yes, uh, like I said, the machine learning model requires a lot of data to train, a lot more than a human brain does. So maybe you can see, maybe you're really smart. You see one example and you can say, OK, I understand what this is. I can make every prediction from now on. Maybe you're, uh, you're like me, you're average. You see 20 examples and then you can say, okay, I can make a reasonable prediction now. Or, you know, maybe you need some more time. You see 50 examples before you can make a correct prediction. A machine learning model will, depending on what you're doing, depending on what algorithm you're using, it will require a lot of data, a lot more data, something like millions of data points. And um mm, yeah collecting that data is difficult getting hold of that data is difficult and um, you cannot train a machine learning model unless you have data or at least a way to generate the data maybe you can there are some algorithms like reinforcement learning reinforcement learning you can train while you're learning so uh, while you're testing actually so you make some mistakes at first it's kind of like the apple example i gave you you make mistakes at first and then you get the hang of it and you can start making better predictions that is like reinforcement learning and uh, another big problem with data is uh, biased data so your data is the your data should be the real world reflection like an example of real world data maybe the data we are assuming that the data is independent of each other but they depend on each other most of the time true uh, sometimes there are features that actually um are redundant i think that's what you're saying so if i have some features which are like uh, radius and diameter why do I need radius and diameter? There is no need. I can get rid of one of them very easily. It's not giving me extra information. It's not giving me uh, any extra uh, data. It's just uh, wasting my memory. But uh, radius and diameter is a very direct example. It's a very uh, you know obvious example that these are redundant data. But it may not be so obvious as well. And it's, it is a problem. It is something that uh, feature selection is something that people have to take care of when they're doing machine learning. And it's not very obvious. There are algorithms for feature selection, uh, certain algorithms that get rid of redundant features like uh, principal component analysis, PCA. And yeah, like the other point that I was going to say, data should not have bias. Yes. So imagine you're on an island and you're you're there with a little kid okay and the island has no one else there's no one else on the island just you and the kid and you show the kid an apple and you say okay this is a banana and you you reference the apple as banana like every time you talk about apples uh, bananas and what will happen is the child will never know that it's an apple the child will grow up believing that the apple is a banana now imagine uh, suppose a little more of a machine learning example uh, you're not the only person on the island there are a hundred people on the island and there's the kid and 95 of those hundred people tell the kid okay the apple is a banana this is a banana it's not an apple and only five people say no this is an apple it's not a banana 
the kid will still grow up believing that uh, the apple is a banana, but with 95% confidence. And um, that is biased data. That is false data, actually. And what happens in machine learning is if the machine has no one to rely on except for the data that you give the machine. And if this data is biased, if this data has misinformation, then your model will learn the bias. It will learn the misinformation. So yes, that is another, yes, another assumption that we come up with when we're training a model that the data should not be biased. There should be data. And there's another assumption, which is um, the problem statement should be solvable by a human at least in some way. I'm not saying that I should be able to solve it, but some human should be able to solve it. Like it should be humanly possible in some way, not uh, computations, not the issue. Uh, forgetting things is not the issue. These are things a computer can handle, uh, but there should be a way to solve it. What I am saying is the data should have a pattern that can be analyzed because if there is no pattern to the data then there is no meaning in finding that function and maybe that pattern is not obvious to us maybe we don't see it maybe we don't realize it but somehow somewhere there should be that pattern so that you can see the data and you can make the prediction and a lot of times I see uh, machine learning ideas that are trying to solve problems that probably cannot be solved, at least yet. And uh, when you're deciding on a model, when you're deciding on a problem statement, maybe keep that in mind that there are limitations as to what a human brain can do and what a computer can do. Uh, human limitations could be in terms of resources, which can be handled by a computer, but something that uh, cannot be done by a human and a computer is probably not solvable in the first place. And of course, data is important. Uh, the data collection part is very important. It should not be biased and it should be in a proper processable form. So. Uh, sometimes you have to do some pre-processing to data. You'll see that some data is, uh, suppose you're working with images and each feature is one pixel on the image. Now you have many images which are of different sizes, uh, different resolutions. So one image has a thousand pixels, another image has 2000 pixels. Now you cannot train a model on varying number of features, right? So you have to fix the number of features, you have to crop the images. Uh, how do you crop the images that you have to figure out? Do you add more pixels? Do you reduce the number of pixels? Uh, do you crop horizontally, vertically? Do you just keep the middle or just one corner of it? These are decisions that you make when you're using the, when you know your data that you're using. And uh, also if you have too many features, it's going to be difficult to train your model because it will take a lot of data. It will take a lot of time. Uh, time is very important in machine learning. Uh, a lot of uh, decisions in terms of the data you use and in terms of the algorithm you use can often save you in terms of time. And time is an important resource. So um, that is all I had to talk about today. Um, feature selection, feasibility. Yeah. So this was a very brief introduction to machine learning in general. And um, we did not go into any algorithms. We didn't go into any uh, particular model or any uh, implementation. You will have time to do that. But because uh, this is how I visualize machine learning and People have said that, you know, machine learning seems difficult, it seems complicated, but really it's just statistics and probability and maths. 
that's all there is and, and not, not even very very difficult maths because the computer will be doing most of it so uh you don't have to worry about that mostly machine learning has a human component to it which i wanted everyone to realize that there is something very human within the entire process of the machine learning and uh, you need to recognize the connection between the human brain and a machine learning algorithm in order to actually understand how it works so i hope i could do that for you and thank you for staying till the end and that's the end of the session if you have any questions i'll hang around for a few more minutes but you can start leaving right now Uh, Arnab has a question. How much data is enough data to make a prediction? Mm. Also depends on the model you're using, like the kind of algorithm. So if you're using something like a neural network, a neural network is basically saying, OK, um, here's the data, find a function. And I don't care how you find the function. It's a black box. You don't really know how the function is found. It's trial and error done many, many times. So anything like that requires a lot of data. So if you're using deep learning, if you're using neural networks, that's a lot of data. And again, it depends on the complexity of the function. So if it's something like a linear relation, something that even a human can manually figure out, then it's uh, it won't take too much data because um, complexity comes when you have a uh, complex data, the data has too much of irregularity. There is not much of a clear trend. And uh, that is when you would need more data. So how much data is enough data? I cannot quote a number. And it's definitely uh, more the measure. Uh, that all also depends on your type of data. So if you have biased data, then you need more data to get over the bias. Uh, you just have to, because the data you have used is just not good enough. But unbiased data, you probably need less data to make a proper prediction. Now, again, if your problem statement is complex, if it's got a lot of uh, complicated things going on, too many features that don't really, uh, you know, it's not very direct and obvious, then you might need more data. Cool. So I don't think there's any other questions. I will probably might take another session, but I'll uh, see that with the team if they want to take over. And <laughs> Arnav, definitely try out ML. It's, uh, it's fun. It's uh, got a lot of math, it's got a lot of theory, it's got a lot of everything. Everyone has a place in ML. Yeah, that, that is, uh, you are describing a recommender system, Abhirup. Uh, recommendation algorithms are used everywhere these days in Facebook, Google, ads. All your ads are basically products of recommendation systems. So when you're using Spotify and you like a certain song or you listen to a particular type of song or you listen to a particular artist many times, you will get recommendations based on whatever you're listening to. Similar genres, similar language, similar artists. That's also machine learning, yes. 
So since we have no more questions, uh, let's end this session right now. And I look forward to seeing you all again in the future sessions. Bye, everyone.